It's the log. I'm Charles Purcell. Uh, hey, I slept through the night. Like two nights in a row. Completely slept through the night. Not bad. I'm still having kind of weird dreams, but they're not too bad. Not too vivid. In fact, I can't even tell you now what my what my dreams were last night. I don't remember them. I think that's a good sign. The really very present, very vivid dreams. You wake up and you feel like you've run a marathon, like you've had you've lived several lives <laughs> in the course of the last eight hours. But it feels good to sleep through the night. And also, here, here, good news. I'll give you good news, and I hope you can share the same good news. Uh, I don't know if you've discovered a particular sleeping pattern that works best for you. Uh, in my career in radio, I've had the occasion to speak with several sleep experts. And the one thing they seem to agree on is that you should find a pattern that works for you and try to stick with it. They don't say, ah, oh, you really should get up early and, and go to bed early early to bed, early to rise thing. They don't, they don't give you that specific advice, but they do say once you find something that works for you, a pattern is good. It's better for your health. And I found the pattern that works for me is when I wake up with the sun. And lately, that's exactly what's been happening. No alarm. Just wake up when the sun wakes me up. And uh, that's been working. So I'm happy about that. Now, my bedtime is a little inconsistent, to say the least. So if I get tired at 10 o'clock and go to sleep and wake up with the sun, well, then I've had a good solid eight hours or more. But if I stay up diddling around until midnight or one or two, then I still wake up with the sun. Well, I get up and then later I need a nap. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, but the main point here is I, I am waking up consistently with the sun and it feels pretty good and I'm sleeping through the night. Now here's something I read once and I don't know if it's true. You tell me this is a question, not a statement, all right? Uh, I heard once that you don't wake up in the night because you have to pee. You have to pee because you woke up. The waking up happens first. And then your brain says, well, you're awake, so uh, okay, let's go pee. Not the other way around. Hey, you got to pee. Wake up. Hey, you got to pee. Wake up. No, no. You wake up first. And that's what I heard. I don't know if it's true or not. But I think it probably is. But I don't know. I'm not going to pretend to know. I'm not an expert in this area. <laughs> I have lots of opinions about a lot of things, but the one thing I promise you, I will never pretend to know something I don't know. And I don't know the truth to this, but uh, it's my memory. I think I read that somewhere or heard that somewhere. Maybe it was one of my sleep experts that I talked to. That's probably it. Yeah, well, maybe it depends on the person. If you have a bladder problem, maybe the uh, peeing does wake you up. Hey, I got to pee. <laughs> That's my impersonation of a bladder. Hey, hey, wake up, wake up. We got to pee. But anyway, I've been sleeping through the night. And that's good. That's good. Still enjoy that early morning time. I'll bet you do too. You and I have talked about this many times, that, that wonderful space between wake and sleep. Not quite asleep, not quite awake, just conscious enough to maybe remember your dreams or have some original thoughts that aren't cluttered up by your to-do list. That's a wonderful creative time. Any, any writer, any artist will tell you. That's a pretty uh, furtive time. Is furtive a word? I think it is. Let's search that right now. Furtive. I said a nice word that I wasn't confident about its meaning. No, it, it is a word, but it's not what I thought. Fertile is the word I wanted. Furtive. Adjective. 
attempting to avoid notice or attention, typically because of guilt or a belief that discovery would lead to trouble. Secretive. The look in his eyes became furtive. Oh, I didn't know that word. That's a new word for me. Today's word of the day, furtive. So an adjective attempting to avoid notice or attention, secretive. The look in his eyes became furtive. Yeah, I was trying to be all smart uh, and not use fertile. I thought furtive maybe was a, an option. No, but it turns out it is a word. I didn't know that. Hmm. Well, what do you know? <laughs> learning. It's all about learning. That was, that was my little joke when I hosted pub trivia. One of my lines I would pull out occasionally. Uh, I wasn't very funny when I hosted pub trivia, but I would attempt to be, I don't know, what the word, again, looking for the right word. Uh, annoying, <laughs> some might say. But yeah, often I would say if uh, something came up that few of us knew, some question and answer, I'd say, oh, we, we learned something tonight. And then I'd go into my little earnest voice and say, yes, I know trivia is fun. We're here to have fun. But what's more important? Why are we really here? To learn. Learning. <laughs> and I'd pause and I'd snicker a little bit like I did just there. and I'd get one or two little smiles. That's all I really ever wanted. I didn't want big laughs. I just wanted some recognition that we're all in this together. <laughs> uh, furtive. All right. No, fertile. Yeah, the, 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 the mind is fertile. Mossy. I heard somebody use that word once in describing, I think it was an old uh, Jimmy Stewart movie, uses the word mossy to describe that fertile feeling in the brain. Is mossy. Yeah. Um, oh, you know what? Uh, it's becoming a, a daily routine here. Corrections and clarifications from the day before. <laughs> I'm getting a little reckless with my presentations. Uh, yeah, I listened back to yesterday's program. And I th first of all, I want to apologize. I was way too whiny. I was way too angry. I was way too preachy. I apologize. Yesterday's show was just terrible. She just, you know, don't. I'm, I apologize for that. We're talking mostly about the environment and climate change and all of that. And especially, mostly we're talking about Planet of the Humans. Michael Moore's new film he executive produced uh, with Jeff Gibbs, writer, producer, director. And all the criticism that it's getting and how I agree with the filmmakers. and So all well and good, fine. But here's the correction clarification. I don't want you to get the idea that I am against any new innovation or new technology. No, 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 no. Of course, of course, of course. Go for it. I got nothing but love for new technology, new innovation, anything that science and research are going to show us. You know, we can do better in the future. That's great. I, I, I feel 100% certain that the filmmakers would agree with that. Of course, technology and innovation have a role to play. So if I overstated that in, in any way yesterday, I, I want to correct that record right now. What the filmmakers, from my viewing of the film, were trying to say, and what I personally agree with, you don't want that tech and that innovation necessarily to be in concert with the profit makers. They're just going to screw things up. They've showed us time after time after time that they screw things up. Great technology, great innovation comes from things like the space program, from the uh, NIH, other institutions of nonprofit learning, of government. And then the profit guys get their hands on it and we're screwed. The other point the filmmakers were making, and I tend to agree, the first technology out of the gate, solar panels and wind turbines, aren't really that great. We got, we got to do a lot better 
than the initial rollout. And, and here's where the critics of Moore and Gibbs, I think, probably had a point. I think the filmmakers did downplay burgeoning technology. They talked about standard solar panels and standard wind turbines that we've all seen now for 20, 30 years. So, okay, I think maybe that was some fair criticism. But yeah, whatever new technology there is, go for it. But please, can we keep it out of the hands of the money guys? That's where I'm with the filmmakers. And that's where the current green movement seems to be making this deal with the devil. And then the final bottom line, which we dealt with sufficiently yesterday. I don't, I don't need to get back into it, but just to, just to put a button on this. We can't ever think that technology and innovation are going to be the grand solution and that we never have to conserve. To use an easy little analogy, thinking that, well, as long as I have this really cool workout bike, I can eat anything I want all day long. I can fill up on frozen pizzas and Hershey miniatures. I can just binge eat all the time because I have this great Bowflex technology workout system. Of course, we know that's not true. Well, the analogy here is we can't continue to consume the way we consume and expect some magic innovation to save us from our own behavior. The inherent growth embedded into the very definition of capitalism has to be thwarted. This idea that we can just have and have and have anything we want, all the travel we want, all the gadgets we want, all the fun, all the toys, all the entertainment, all the time. Grow, 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 have, 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 do, do, do. Da dum 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 do 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 and and that we can just have all that we we can't i i know it sounds like i'm asking us to sacrifice maybe i am but i don't think of it as a sacrifice we'll get a little uh philosophical here if you let me i th- i think if we live a simpler life if we have less you know, you've heard this before. You, you don't need me to tell you. This is ancient wisdom, something I tend to agree with. The less is more thing. If you have less, if you do less, if you just get a little quiet, if you walk gently on the earth, you're going to be way happier. If you have less crap in your house, you're going to be happier. If you're not always, every f***ing night, going out desperately trying to entertain yourself. If you can find entertainment and peace and contentment and fulfillment in simple things, you're going to be happier. Preach! So it's a win-win. It's better for us. It's better for the planet. And we don't all die. And you can incorporate that into your lives. I'm not saying we all have to be, and we can't be. I know, we can't be this perfect, organic farmer. I'm not asking you to do that. That's that's a lot of people's dream, to live out in the wide open spaces and be kind of a neo-hippie. A lot of us would love to be that iconic, organic hero, Right? Somebody shared this post that I want to share with you. Our only real defense against bio-warfare is to stop eating big ag and big foods poison products and instead strengthen our health and our immune systems, clean up the world's air, water, and environment, shut down factory farms, stop destroying wildlife habitat, and pray that herd immunity eventually stops the spread of COVID-19. Wait, what? (laughs) I was with him. I was with him right there until the end. This is a guy I don't know. His name is Ronnie Cummins, Organic Consumers Association International Director. I'll have to look this guy up. But I'll tell you the story on this one, talking about conspiracy theories. One of my friends, 
was posting all this conspiracy stuff. So I went to her page. I was curious to see what, what else she was about. And she had a lot of things that I really agreed with. That's the thing about conspiracies. They, they catch you. They catch you with the good stuff. And then they... So I'm really down with all of this. Although I'm not sure what he means by bio-warfare. I guess I know what he means. Us against the viruses. So I should have been tipped off from the top. Our only real defense is what he says. And our only real defense. In other words, screw all doctors. Fauci and the rest. Stop eating big ag. Absolutely right. We have to do that. Big foods, poison products, completely correct. Absolutely. Instead, strengthen our health and our immune systems. Right on. Clean up the world's air. Yes. And by the way, that takes public policy. That's a political thing. See, a lot of the the hippy-dippy tree hugger people who I love and would love to emulate, they somehow don't understand that it it takes public policy to get some of this stuff done. You can't just wish your way to it. You can't just do your little affirmations before bed and you're going to wake up, it'll happen. No, no. Uh, But again, this is all good. Clean up the world's air. Yes. Water. Yes. Environment. Yes. Shut down factory farms. Absolutely. That needs to be a thing that never, ever returns. It needs to go away and never come back. Factory farms. Stop destroying wildlife habitat. Yes, absolutely. But then now now he totally blows it (laughs) and pray that herd immunity eventually stops the the spread of COVID-19. Oh man, Ronnie, what are you talking about? You blew it, man. No, no, no. (laughs) We got to do what we have to do today. We don't, we're not going to pray. Praying's got nothing to do with it. We're going to social distance and we're going to look for a vaccine and we're going (laughs) to, so (laughs) It was, it was perfect up until then. Like imagine you get a, imagine you have a, a perfect, nutritious, beautiful meal on your plate right in front of you. But then one little corner of it is injected with arsenic. <laughs> well, that little that last little thing, pray for herd immunity. The only way to stop COVID-19. That's his little shot of arsenic. I'll have to look up. You know what? I'll look up Ronnie Cummins and find out who he is and tell you tomorrow. Because that's our segue into... Uh, the conspiracy theory stuff, which as it turns out, we don't really have to do. (laughs) If you listen to yesterday's show, I talked about how this might be over in just one 24 hour news cycle. And that's kind of what happened. And by now you, you all know what I'm talking about, especially the whole pandemic video, but there was more to it than that, but that was kind of the centerpiece of it. So we started seeing it on Tuesday. It hit the fan. Oh my God. On Wednesday, it was everywhere, everywhere. People were sharing it like crazy. By the end of the day, YouTube had put the kibosh on that and they'd silenced it and that got more uh, blowback. Oh, freedom of speech. So Wednesday was insane. So then I talked to you yesterday, Thursday, and I already had some other stuff on my plate here. I wanted to talk about Michael Moore and the film and, and all of that. So I said, okay, let's, let's put this off till tomorrow, Friday. And then I had the thought, well, this might be all over by tomorrow. And as it turns out, it is. <laughs> they got such blowback immediately. They, and now all they're, they're gone. They just shut up. <laughs> so good. So, you know, I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on this. If you have any kind of social media life at all, you've heard this. The fact-checking, Snopes and the rest of them, and other people independently have done their own fact-checking and just destroyed these ridiculous notions. There's one that didn't sound so ridiculous that maybe I should talk about just briefly, and that is that uh, hospitals are getting paid more if they designate deaths as COVID-19 related. Well, as with many conspiracy theories, they start with some truth, but then they extrapolate into (laughs) their nuttiness. And there is some truth to that because, as you know, laws get very complicated by their very nature these days. That's one of my pet peeves. That's one of my, uh, if I were president, if I were president, Laws would be very simple and short, and everyone could understand exactly what they say when they read them. 
if I were president. Uh, yeah, laws are long and complicated, and there's so many opportunities for nefarious types to dig into laws and find ways to benefit, to profit. Uh, even uh, before they're written, they uh, get their lobbyists to intentionally do these kinds of things. But then once they are written, they get their lawyers and their teams all buried in the legislation and they find, okay, how can we profit from this? And that's what, yeah, hospitals did that. Hospital administrators. Now, you gotta, first you got to make the distinction here. We're not talking about doctors and nurses. We're talking about hospital administrators, for-profit hospitals. And as for-profit entities, they got a little evil in them. And their natural tendency is to try to maximize profits. That's just what they do. So, yes, uh, because of the law, they could finagle ways to get some money out of this uh, whole Rube Goldberg law, the CARES Act, and uh, other attending legislation. So, yeah, there's some truth to that. But it certainly doesn't meet the uh, criteria of full-blown conspiracy. Aha, this is how we'll make money. We'll pretend there's a COVID-19 pandemic. And then we'll say that, you know. The, and uh, so I got nothing new to tell you. This is what you know. You know that the anti-vaxxers are there. You know that the astroturfed protesters and the militia types just looking for any excuse to say freedom America. You know what that's all about. But the, um, oh, and just one little headline here. You probably know this. But you know the whole thing about the, the scientist who was jailed after discovering a deadly virus delivered through vaccines? That one, uh, the big one. You know, she was, she was in jail for stealing equipment from the lab from which she was fired. <laughs> and, uh, and her claims in her video are all just comically bogus. It's been fact-checked. In fact, I'm looking at a headline here. Let's see. This is, uh, I think this is Snopes. Published December 8th, 2018. So almost a year and a half ago, this was debunked. What is the deal? I don't know why conspiracy theorists are what they are. I don't understand. I found this, uh, let's see, headline, Stamford advocate. Conspiracy theories run rampant when people feel helpless. Like now, Adam M. Enders and Joseph E. Usinski, Washington Post. As the coronavirus pandemic has unfolded, conspiracy theories about the origins, threat, and basic nature of the virus have become an increasingly visible and consequential element of the timeline. Conspiracy theories have tangible consequences for individuals and society, especially when they are sanctioned by trusted members of society, such as political business and religious leaders. They can decrease people's willingness to get vaccinated or comply with social distancing directives. Yeah, it's one thing to uh, go on and on about the Kennedy assassination or the moon landing, but there are real-time consequences for uh, current conspiracy theorists especially at a time when we really have to get together and be smart about prevention and stay-at-home orders and social distancing and wearing masks. and Yeah, this has real, serious, real-time implications this time. So, um, continuing here. So why exactly do these bizarre ideas spread, especially among our relatives, friends, and neighbors who otherwise seem like reasonable citizens? who heed scientific evidence and make rational decisions about the health and safety of their families. There is no shortage of COVID-19 conspiracy theories, and they tend to follow the same patterns as conspiracy theories about other types of major events and public health crises. Some are infused with partisan politics, such as the idea that Democrats are strategically exaggerating the threat to hurt President Trump's chances at re-election. Originally stoked by Trump, this idea has snowballed into even more fantastical claims about the absence of COVID-19 patients in hospitals. De okay, yeah, uh, not only especially dangerous because of the current time we're living in, but especially dangerous because of the current occupant of the White House. When 
there's this vicious loop here from crazy conspiracy theory to uh, a certain Twitter account to Fox News and then wider spread of these ridiculous ideas. And now they are confirmed by Trump's state media, amplified further, and the cycle continues. Uh, So, yeah, this is not your run-of-the-mill conspiracy theory. This is not the Loch Ness Monster. This has real consequences. Let me just read a little bit more of this. Beliefs in conspiracy theories have roots in a number of social and political factors. For example, those who have stumbled upon misfortune are more likely to endorse conspiracy theories as a means of explaining their undesirable lot in life. Partisans endorse conspiracy theories that malign the other party or that have been championed by their own partisan and ideological leaders. Uh, The same goes for the devoutly religious. The altar can function as a bully pulpit for religious leaders to guide their parishioners toward misinformation Psychologists have identified a number of psychological traits that are related to conspiracy beliefs, including the predisposition to see systematic patterns where there is only random noise or to interpret coincidence as intentional cause. But when it comes to a global pandemic and the deaths, social isolation, and collapsing economy that it has brought about, three other factors are key, uncertainty, anxiety, and powerlessness. All right, so this is a very good, I found this article helpful. I'm going to let you finish it. It's from the Washington Post. If you pay for that subscription, I always run out of my free articles uh, within the first few days of the month. (laughs) So the site I'm reading now, uh, it's been republished, and you can still read it on stamfordadvocate.com. Conspiracy theories run rampant when people feel helpless like now. So uh, that's all we need to say about the conspiracy theories today. Hopefully they've run their course. Hopefully they'll die down. I understand there's going to be a certain segment of the population who just can't resist them and they're going to share them. But my real, uh, my fear is when they start to infiltrate into the mainstream and can do real serious damage. So there it is. Have we got more to say? No, we're done. I love you. It's the weekend. Here we go. That's the log for Friday, May 8th. I'm Charles Purcell. Have a great weekend. I'll talk to you on Monday. This episode of The Log is available right now wherever you find your podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, iHeart, YouTube, and the podcast source. Enter Charles Bursell Presents in the search window. Or best yet, go to charlesbursell.com. There you'll find this and all the other series in the podcast family. Follow, comment, and contact me on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks to our flagship terrestrial station, Riverwest Radio, riverwestradio.com. Theme music composed and performed by Peter Donalds. From the New Arts and Media Studios in Milwaukee, I'm Charles Purcell. <laughs>